first of all, Kenichiwa. It's an honor for me to be here today. And thank you for honoring my story. I want to open with a paradox. Who's heard of life sucks and then you die? Anybody? OK. <laughs> if you've ever felt like me, life sometimes does suck. But it's the wrong way of looking at that paradox. Because sometimes, and most times, when we're in our most challenging moments and the most difficult times of our lives, this is the time when we find meaning in our lives and we get to know who we are in that context. And I'm here today to offer a second part to life sucks and then you die. And that is, there's a value in paying a price. Just to give you a little bit of background, I started my career off as a ballet dancer in South Africa. <laughs> Can't you see? <laughs> Do a few pirouettes. Um, and that was to be my career. I followed my grandmother and my mother from, the, from Royal Ballet School and the Royal Ballet Company into dancing for KPAB in South Africa. And when I was laid off sick, or uh, injured, I'd rather say, my parents approached me very seriously and said, you know, Wendy, you were quite academic at school, weren't you? And I said, well, sort of. And they said, how about you becoming a chartered accountant? <laughs> <laughs> Ballet dancer, chartered accountant. I cannot think of a bigger divide. <laughs> but perhaps that's a good example of conditioning and projection. Anyway, I took them up on their offer and I became a chartered accountant. I left my ballet shoes hanging in the, in the wardrobe. And I'm pleased to say I um, went through a course of being an accountant but specializing in corporate treasury. And I climbed the corporate ladder. I broke through the glass ceiling. You know that ceiling, ladies, that has got lipstick <laughs> stuck on the top? <laughs> I broke through that. And I was the only female executive in my particular team in a company that was a public listed company on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. It was known as the darling of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. I've got to tell you, I had the corner office. I had a leather lounge suite in my corner office. I had glass windows overlooking the suburbs. And most of all, I got to use the exclusive lift that took me right up to the executive suite. Pretty hot, eh? <laughs> I want to tell you that I believed, and I was in my late 30s by then, I believed that I had arrived. However, it was in the year 2000, after I'd been in this company for almost nine years, that I discovered endemic fraud and corruption. What was worse? was it was being committed by the joint CEOs of this public listed company and the founders. They were the founders of this company. And they were embezzling hundreds of millions of rands offshore into secret bank accounts. So as the group treasurer and as a human being, firstly, I was met with a moral dilemma. Do I do what we're most of us are taught to do? And that's mind our own business, look the other way pretend it didn't happen, secure my own career? Or do I consider my pro-social contract with humanity? Because humanity is our business. And I chose to speak out. And in South Africa, in the year 2000, there were no whistleblowing laws, there were no protective acts. So I, w I knew that I was taking a great risk, but I chose to stand up and speak out. And my life changed irrevocably from that day on. I lost my job, I lost my career, I lost my reputation, but more so, I was about to lose my life. I began to get death threats. They were cowardly anonymous, and they came through via emails, and they came through via telephone calls, threatening my and my son, who was 12, year old, or 12 years old at the time, threatening to kill us. And in a South African context, where whistleblowers are killed or jailed, 
I wasn't about to lose my life. And I'm sure you can understand, it's bad enough being hated by one person. It's worse to be hated by a group. But the vitriol and the poison from a society was untenable. A society that wasn't ready for the truth. A society that felt that whistleblowers were interrupting their worldview of what is and were not prepared to look for the reality of the situation. So what did I do next? I took my 12-year-old son and I fled to the UK where I put myself in self-imposed exile. Very quickly though, because of my qualifications, I got two very significant job offers as a group treasurer for Channel 4 um, and another company who I won't name, but it's a very well-known internationally branded company. And I took the job that wasn't the Channel 4 job. Um, unbeknownst to me that the owner of this particular business into which I had now found myself, or chosen rather, he was in negotiations with the two individuals in South Africa who I'd blown the whistle on. And when he discovered that I was the whistleblower against them, he fired me. And because I had only worked for the company six months, I had no statutory rights in terms of uh, the law. And I've got to say, at that point in time, having lost my job in South Africa for doing the right thing, for being fired in a Kafkaesque fashion without any legitimate reason, sent me sprawling. I didn't quite, I couldn't understand this foreign world, this chaotic foreign world. And I simply had a meltdown. I sealed myself off from the rest of the world. I made sure that any cracks or fissures were sealed off from any further potential chaos and disorder because I knew I couldn't cope with it. The period that followed in my life thereafter was pervasively dark and despairing. My life became silent and mundane and I considered alternative methods almost to the point of injuring myself to break through my numbness, to be able to feel again, to be able to connect with others. I had effectively been expelled from the playground of life for telling the truth. And it just didn't seem just. And I, I, I didn't know how to cope with it. I knew my world was upside down. And I had to begin to think that perhaps Upside down wasn't a bad place for me to be. And who's to say that upside down is the wrong place anyway? And it was at this juncture that I was able to go out and beg on the streets. Because I'd gone for job interviews. And what I'd been told, the feedback that I got from recruitment agencies uh, was, we're sorry, Wendy, but whistleblowers are not a welcome addition to an executive team. They simply don't want you. And this is where I also understood, and, and anyone that runs a business or is operating within a business need to remember this, that Google is not just a research tool, it's a reputational management tool. And I found that out to my peril, that I was all over the internet as the whistleblower for the biggest corporate disaster in South African history. No one wanted me. And all my skills, everything that I'd learned, were simply thrown aside, as I was, as a human being. And this cardboard cutout part of myself, this one-dimensional Wendy, was able to, at that point, recognize I had no food to feed my 12-year-old son. I had no money to pay the rent for the house that we were staying in. And the only best thing that I could do was go on the streets with my 12-year-old and beg so that we could survive. So you can imagine, I'd gone from being a senior executive with a plush carpets corner office 
to literally standing on the streets in London begging. And here, where, this is where the story begins to become hopeful. And this is where there's a value in paying a price. Because I learned when you have a meltdown like this, your hard skills don't simply disappear. You maintain your hard skills. I was the best beggar on the block. <laughs> I had to reframe what I understood success to be. Up to that point, or up until my executive career ended, my success was framed as the acquisition of more, the consumption of more. I had enough money to buy the next pair of Jimmy Choo shoes, or take myself out for a nice meal, or simply go on holiday, remove myself from my reality. But in these situations, I had to go within, because there was nothing else for me out there. And like a pencil, I recognized that it's the granite within the pencil that counts, not the painted veneer on the outside. It was within me what counted, and I chose to hang on to that with all the hope that I had. Besides being the best beggar, providing cash flows, budgeting Excel worksheets, <laughs> I knew exactly how much I had to play with, but more so, when you become a beggar, and I'm not diminishing this experience because it was terrible. But when you become a beggar, you can't simply pull in and start begging. You have ne to negotiate your place. So I chose Kingston upon Thames railway station. Some of you may know. <laughs> and, but I had to negotiate my spot and I had to uh, trade skills, skill sets with other beggars that couldn't do Excel spreadsheets to help them. <laughs> so, my budgeting Excel spreadsheets came in well. My negotiate, negotiating skills were fabulous. And furthermore, I observed that British people love dogs. So what did I do? I got my two dogs and I used my marketing skills by putting my dogs next to me and it appealed to their sense of empathy. So I, I'm, t I'm wanting to tell you that it's all okay. You never, you never lose your hard skills, no matter what context you're in, okay? <laughs> the other great thing about it is, yes, I got to experience the vitriol, the mocking, the condemnation of people that walked past me, that didn't know who I was, tossed the odd one pound in my cap on the floor. But I also got to experience the capacity for people to love cherish, honor, and empathize with others. I got to ask one of the most difficult questions in life. You know what that is? Can you help me? How many of us can actually articulate that? I learned to do that. What's more, I learned, I utilized that skill, that ability to ask for help, to begin building my profile again to begin building a new business from that. On the days that I had begged for one day, but I'd, I'd got two days worth of begging money, I rewarded myself, which is also very important. And I'd go off into nature, Richmond Park, to seek solace mainly. But I found something else. I found a reflection of me in nature, just like me. Nature doesn't have a currency. I didn't have any money. Nature doesn't have a currency, but it still holds value for us. Why is it as human beings, we, we value nature, we have cut flowers in our homes, we mimic nature, birds flying, fish swimming, we mimic, we, we value nature, but it doesn't have a currency. That currency is life. Nature uses every situation enabled by every opportunity to be its best self. And I chose to copy that. That was me. And we are all part of it. We are nature. So I chose to copy that. I, I was going to be that nature. So I became that river that broke through rock. 
not because I'm strong, clearly not, but because I was persistent, because I had tenacity, because I committed myself to doing what's right. I never faltered. I became the farmer who plants the seed in the ground. He doesn't dig it up to see if it's grown roots. He leaves it there and he nurtures it. He loves it, he cherishes it, and he grows it. The court case, in terms of the individuals that blew the, the whistle on, took 11 years. And I had to blow the whistle a second time after seven years because of bribery and obfuscation by the South African Judicial Services. So even though they were sentenced in 2007 to jail terms, it all got removed off the data. And when I was informed, I took on the judicial services in South Africa. And now, of course, I was meddling with the South African government. Not a safe place to be. But I was prepared to do what's right. And I persevered. And I never relented. It took me from 2008 to 2011 before they were jailed. Actually physically went to jail. Thank you. So back to being this nature. That's what nature does. And what got me thinking was also, I had to look around at nature and I thought, hang on a minute, nature has seasons, right? Why do we allow, we give permission for nature to have all four seasons? But why do we always feel the need to be spring or summer? Why can't we also be autumn and winter? Why can't we allow ourselves or give ourselves permission to die back, to contract? to be still, to reassess. And then from those new roots, from the breakdown in autumn and winter, you have the breakthrough of new life. And the seeds of my new life was my company, Speak Out, Speak Up. In terms of training people to be able to find their voice, and I'm not just talking about corporate arenas, I'm talking about children, bullying, sexual abuse, domestic abuse, how people speak to you, how you allow them to speak to you. If we don't have a voice to say, I don't like what I'm hearing, we're not gonna change any, we're not gonna change the status quo. So my mission out of my company is to teach people to find their voices, to speak out, so we can change the status quo. I realized I was my son's hero when he came home from school one day. And he was very upset because he'd done this oral in class. And he said, the, the teacher thought I was lying. She thought I'd made up the story. And I said, well, what was the, what was the content, you know? He said, the title of my oral was My Hero. So I thought, naturally, as a South African, he would have spoken about Nelson Mandela, who's very much in my thoughts at the moment. And he said, no, man. I told them your story. And it, it actually chokes, chokes me up when I... When I, when I tell you the story, but I realized how monumental it is to be your son's hero. Mm. He then, as he got older, he told me furthermore that this would be my legacy. And I thought, wow, this is so much more significant than leaving him bricks and mortar or a lot of money in the bank account. This is my legacy. What's more, <laughs> I'm still beginning to accept that I'm my own hero. And that's important. And at that juncture of my life, I asked myself the question, if I were to die right now, how would I feel about my life? And I've got to tell you, pleased, pretty chuffed. <laughs> if I look back on my life, it's meaningful, it's rich, it's purposeful. How many of you have asked yourself that question? If I die today, what do I leave behind me? Do that. My call to action to you today is ask yourself that question because it's the retrospective questions that give you the fullest answers. Don't be afraid of that question because it actually can propel you into making changes in your lives. If I can do it, you can do it. And then finally, I want to finish off uh, knowing N Nelson Mandela is now finally on his true walk to freedom, to true freedom, he used a quote from Mariam Williamson that said, and I may get this wrong, uh, forgive me, but it went like this. 
Who are you to play small? You don't serve the world by playing small. When you stand in your own light and your own power, you give permission for others to do the same. So do that today. Thank you.